You mentioned Guido, the the benevolent dictator for life of Python. What does he think about Mojo? Have you talked to him much about it? Uh, I have talked with him about it. He found it very interesting. Um, we actually talked with Guido before it launched, and so he was aware of it before it went public. Um, I have a ton of respect for Guido for a bunch of different reasons. You talk about Walrus Operator, and yeah. like Guido is pretty amazing in terms of steering such a huge and diverse community and 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 like driving it forward and i think python is what it is thanks to him right and so to me it was really important starting to work on mojo to get his feedback and get his input and get his eyes on this right now um a lot of what guido was is was and is i think concerned about is how do we not fragment the community yeah we don't want a Python two to Python three thing. Like that was that was really painful for everybody involved, and so we spent quite a bit of time talking about that and some of the tricks I learned from Swift, for example. So in the, in the migration from Swift, we managed to like not just convert Objective C into a slightly prettier Objective C, which we did. Mm -hmm. We then converted not entirely, but almost an entire community to a completely different language, <laughs> right? And so there's a bunch of tricks that you learn along the way that are directly relevant to what we do. And so this is where, for example, the you leverage CPython while bringing up the new thing. Mm -hmm. Like that that approach is, I think, proven and, and comes from experience. And so Guido is very interested in like, okay, cool. Like, I think that Python is really his legacy. It's his baby. I have ton, tons of respect for that. Incidentally, I see Mojo as a member of the Python family. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to take Python away from Guido and from the Python community. Um, uh, and so uh, to me, it's really important that we're a good member of that community. And so he, I think that, again, you, you would have to ask Guido this, but I think that he was very interested in this notion of like, cool, Python gets beaten up for being slow. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a path out of that. Right. And that, you know, if the future is Python, right? I mean, look look at the 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 far outside case on this, right? And I'm not saying this is Guido's perspective, but you know, there's this path of saying, like, okay, well, suddenly Python can suddenly go all the places it's never been able to go before. Right. And that means that Python can go even further and can have even more impact on the world. So in some sense, Moja could be seen as Python four point oh. I would not say that. I think that would drive a lot of people really crazy. Because of the PTSD of the 3.02. I mean, I'm willing to annoy people about Emacs versus Vim or but about not that versus one. Spaces. But not that one. I don't know. That might be a little bit far even for me. Like my th my skin may not be that thick. But, but the, the point is the step to being a superset and allowing all of these capabilities, I think, is the evolution of a language. It feels like an evolution of a language. So he he's interested by the ideas that you're playing with, but also concerned about the fragmentation. So how, what are the ideas you've learned? What are you thinking about? How do we avoid fragmenting the community where the the, the Pythonistas and the, uh, I don't know what to call the Mojo people. Uh, magicians. The magicians, yeah, I like it. <laughs> there you uh, go. Can coexist happily and and share code and basically just have these big code bases that are using uh, C Python and more and more moving yeah, towards Mojo. Yeah. Well, so again, th these are lessons I learned from Swift and and here we face very similar problems, right? In Swift, you have Objective C, super dynamic. Uh, they're very different syntax, <laughs> right? But you, you're talking to people who have large scale code bases. I mean, Apple's got the biggest, largest scale code base of Objective C code, right? And so, you know, none of the companies, none of the iOS developers, none of the other developers want to rewrite everything all at once. And so you want to be able to adopt things piece at a time. And so, a thing that I found that worked very well in the Swift community was saying, okay, cool. And this is when Swift was very young. And she say, okay, you have a million line of code Objective-C app, don't rewrite it all. But when you implement a new feature, go implement that new class using Swift, mm -hmm. right? And so now this turns out is a very wonderful thing for an app developer, but it's a huge challenge for the compiler team and the systems people that are implementing mm -hmm. this, right? And this comes back to what is this trade-off between doing the hard thing that enables scale versus doing the theoretically pure and ideal thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so Swift had adopted and built a lot of different machinery to deeply integrate with the Objective-C runtime. Mm -hmm. And we're doing the same thing with Python, right? Now, what, what happened in the case of Swift is that Swift as a language got more and more and more mature over time, 
right? And uh, incidentally, Mojo is a much simpler language than Swift in many ways. And so I think that Mojo will develop way faster than Swift for a variety of reasons. Um, but as the language gets more mature, in parallel with that, you have new people starting new projects, right? And so if, when the language is mature and somebody's starting a new project, that's when they say, okay, cool, I'm not dealing with a million lines of code. I'll just start and use the new thing for my whole stack. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is, again, you come back to where communities and where people that work together, you build a new subsystem or a new feature or a new thing in Swift, or you build a new thing in Mojo, then you want to be in, end up being used on the other side, <laughs> right? And so then you need to work on integration back the other way. And so it's not just Mojo talking to Python, it's also Python talking to Mojo, mm -hmm. right? And so what I would love to see, and the, I don't want to see this next month, right? But what I want to see over the course of time is I would love to see people that are building these packages, like, you know, NumPy or, uh, you know, TensorFlow or, what you know, th these packages that are half Python, half C++. And if you say, okay, cool, I want to get out of this Python C++ world into a unified world, and so I can move to Mojo, but I can't give up all my Python clients. Because mm -hmm. they're, like, these libraries get used by everybody, and they're not all going to switch every, all, all, you know, all at once, and maybe never, right? Well, so the way we should do that is we should vend Python interfaces to the Mojo types. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did in Swift, and it worked great. I mean, it was a huge implementation challenge for the compiler people, right? But um, there's only a dozen of those compiler people, and there are millions of users. And so it's a very expensive, capital-intensive, like, skill set-intensive problem. But once you solve that problem, it really helps adoption. It really helps the community progressively adopt technologies. And so I think that this approach will work quite well with, with the Python and the Mojo world. So for a package, port it to Mojo, and then create a Python interface. Yep.